Thank you. Um, and I think that is that, that, that sense of when you get to a fire soon enough, you dramatically transform the damage done. It is the one thing you learn, every governor in the West learns, is that if you can get there in that first few hours when it's smoldering before it breaks into a blaze, uh, you've, got a, you've got a very good chance of, of controlling it. Um, let me switch a little bit. Uh, Dr. Calvin, uh, how will NASA and the Earth Information Center, this is the new center that Bill Nelson talked about in 2021, uh, coordinate with other federal agencies to address priorities, wildfires, but methane emissions, land use? So much of this, and I think you all could speak on this in terms of the, the great challenges to orchestrate and to integrate all the different sources of data. So speak to that if you can start. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for the question. I think what we all recognize is that there's increasing challenges. We've just been talking about wildfire, and um, there's other agriculture and droughts, and we have a lot of information both at NASA and other federal agencies, and the idea behind the Earth Information Center is to bring that together and make that information accessible to people so that they can respond to the challenges they're seeing in their communities. Um, and there are a lot of complementary sets of information or all around the federal government. One of the prototypes that we're thinking of for the Earth Information Center is around greenhouse gas uh, in monitoring and in measurement. And here there's an interagency working group that's been actively working together on how you can bring that data together. So how can you take the activity-based inventories produced by EPA and combine it with satellite-based observations from NASA and other ground and surface-based observations from other agencies and bring that all together to pro provide more complete information. And so we look forward to working with our federal partners to make that a reality. Yeah, you know, and I'm old enough, I think I'm the only person here that's old enough to remember when Landsat first delivered images, real images, before we'd seen it in movies. We had various art directors' uh, perspective, what they thought that it would look like, but it was so different when we saw it. And, you know, it really is, to this day, one of the most, to, to, to remember back to how amazingly transformational it was in our consciousness. It's hard to imagine today. Uh, Mr. Jablonski, obviously there's been a rise in the uh, commercial small sats, these constellations of small satellites, um, and a, a number of companies such as Maxar have demonstrated the ability to pr produce high resolution, very high resolution uh, Earth observation data. Uh, what, uh, what can small, small sats, if that's a word, um, it must be a word because it's written here, what can small sats with higher resolution uh, imagers, uh, well, how, how can they provide targeted uh, observations over specific areas of interest? And what, what are some of the, what, what is an example of, of that? Uh, well, thanks, Senator. Um, I, I think probably the best way to, to tee that up would be to, to describe uh, the vast amount of data coming in from the commercial as well as government satellites and how that's being, you know, uh, dealt with uh, to make to help decision makers um, uh, take action on it in a, in a fairly rapid fashion. So, for example, Maxar's uh, satellites have 30 centimeter pixel size, so that anything with a uh, you know larger than 30 centimeters in a frame becomes visible. Um, that means we can uh, not only see, but but using artificial intelligence algorithms, count all the cars in a city in a single satellite pass, and do that in seconds because of the the revolutions that we've had in cloud computing, as well as machine learning uh, algorithms and artificial intelligence in recent years. Um, it's been uh, demonstrably, I think, very effective in matching that type of data with weather patterns, for example, to then help fight wildfires in the West. So not only understanding where the fires are, but when you overlay weather patterns and terrain and elevation and difficulty in road networks and where resources are, figure out the best way to rapidly uh, minimize the, the damages and impacts that might be happening while keeping lives safe because when people go out into the field, if they're on the wrong upslope and the wind changes, you know, that's when you can have a loss of emergency responders' lives. So um, Maxar and other commercial providers uh, collect massive amounts of the planet every day, um, uh, millions and millions of, of square kilometers and terabytes and petabytes of data. And it's too much for any one human to get through. So the getting that data into the right places, um, making it accessible uh, through cloud-enabled environments, internet-enabled environments, so that the first responders in a, uh, a command center in, in Wyoming or Colorado can get to that information quickly and then overlay their decisions onto it is, is what we're, we're working on. 
Perfect. Um, Dr. Uh, Abdullahi, uh, you have a great deal of experience working with uh, NASA and NOAA. Uh, um, CU Boulder now has a research partnership with NOAA. Uh, can you discuss the importance of interagency coordination uh, to federally funded Earth observation missions and, and maybe a concise suggestion or two for improvement? <laughs> well, certainly the, the coordination is absolutely critical um, because we have on, you know, upstream of the effort is the development of the technologies, testing of the technologies, then deployment of the technologies to learn how to observe the parameters we need to observe. And then further downstream, as you see in the case of Landsat, for example, or the satellites that support weather forecasting, we have the use of those capabilities um, to advance science, to advance applications, to provide information uh, that inform our day-to-day our -day planning. So uh, the, the spectrum of activities from discovery and discovering how to discover uh, is, is at one end to the other end of using the information, turning that into something of direct value to people. So that doesn't happen with just NASA doing its part and then kicking it over to USGS or kicking it over to NOAA. There needs to be this, this reach across agencies, um, and it does exist, uh, where at the user end of things, the more operational end of, of uh, that continuum, the needs are articulated so that NASA further upstream can be working toward delivering something that can be of use. And at the same time, um, as new capabilities emerge and are being developed, the operational agencies need to be aware of what the potential is. So that integration is absolutely critical. And as far as improving it, I, I will say this, it, it works well in an interaction sense where I would suggest improvements is there are still things that fall through the cracks because NOAA USGS has its mission, have their missions. NASA has its capabilities that it develops. And when, when the mission-centric perspective, as is appropriate, is, is exercised by the agencies, they're looking at, okay, what do I have to fulfill my mission? There are observations that need to be done, that need to be continued, that don't quite fit into the operational space, but have been developed and continue to be developed by NASA. Um, and finding a way to, to keep those going, even though they support knowledge, they support um, understanding our planet and how it operates, don't necessarily map to the operational Got function it. of the agency. So some overarching entity that says, this is what the enterprise needs to carry out, I Appreciate think would that. improve it. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Lummis, 